may not know her. Um, and and you'll be here just for a couple of weeks? Yeah, just for 10 days. For 10 oh, days. Wow. All right. Well, while she's here, Dr. Lieva has her visiting language classes, culture classes, graduate writing class, um, things like that. So anyway, we're delighted and, and we'll be excited to see what we can share and learn from you and all of those things. So thanks for being here. Our other guest <laughs> is Rebecca Desiru. Yes. From Very good. the Graduate Writing Center, which is not the same as the Undergraduate Writing Center. But it is in the same place. But in the same place. But on a much higher level. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally. Oh, yeah. Yes. So I'm going to just turn the time over to you for a few minutes. Thank you. I'm happy to be here once again. Um, did everyone get one of these um, things? I think you came in later. I want to make sure everyone gets them because we always order promotional materials and I think that we do. But this year we actually ordered something useful to these sticky tabs that you can use when you're doing your research um, to mark places or quotes in your articles or books. And so I think they're pretty useful. And I was writing my presentation. So. I'm also going to pass around my card. So if you want to contact me directly, feel free to do so. So, my name is Rebecca. <laughs> um, I completed my PhD in literature a couple of years ago through Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, but I've been working in Utah at the Reed Center for about five years. And I was hired to work with nursing and education graduate students, so you people. Um, and I've been doing that for several years now. So I've gotten very familiar with the conventions of educational writing. And also some of the preferences of um, different professors. <laughs> so I might have a little bit of insight about that too. Um, but um, I'm here to help you at any stage of the writing process. So whether you're just organizing and planning your assignment or your proposal, your thesis, you're in the drafting phase, the revising phase, or even um, you've gotten some feedback from one of your community members and you're not sure how to incorporate it, or you are sure how to incorporate it and realize how hard it's going to be. <laughs> um, I work a lot with lit reviews and introductions, but I can have you at any stage, like I said. People just seem to really have a mental block at the lit review stage, so they often have to do that. But like I said, any stage of the writing process, you know, um, and I also work a lot with APA. I've spent now many hours quality time reading the APA manual. So <laughs> um, the service is completely free to you as students, so I'd like to emphasize that. Um, I don't have my hours, unfortunately, on our bookmark because those are the undergraduate hours. My hours are mainly afternoon and evening hours, and if you want to write them down, um, I'm available to you Monday through Thursday, 1 to 8 p.m., and then Fridays 2 to 5. May so, I interrupt to say that she did, that when she very first came, she was on a more normal schedule, and when we explained what your schedules were, she adjusted, so thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, and just, can you just repeat that one minute? Sure, Monday through Thursday, 1 to 8 p.m., and Fridays 2 to 5. Um, Appointments are usually an hour. You don't have to take that long, but it is nice to have that amount of time so you can really discuss things and see what your what your concerns are and what your committee's concerns are. Um, so, have all of you gotten one of these bookmarks? Our schedule is all online now, and it's the same um, website for the Graduate Writing Center and the Undergraduate Writing Center. Um, and it tells you how to register. You need to go to that website. It's called MyWC Online, or My Writing Center, WC, online.com. And you register a, for an account. It just takes like less than a minute. You basically put in your email address and a password, and that's how it notifies you of your appointment, is through email. Um, and then you'll sign into the main page, and there's a drop down menu at the top that has like a bunch of options like main center, web conference, and stuff. But you want to select graduate writing center. And when you select that, you're making an appointment directly with me. Uh -huh. And so that I'm the only people, I'm the only person that gets that. So hopefully that's good. If you'd like to work with an undergraduate, you can do that too. <laughs> um, so yes, that's it. And if you have um, questions about how to do that, you can call the front desk. They're very helpful, or you can just email me directly. 
Um, after we met face to face, if you have follow up questions over email, I'm happy to answer those. If it's like, how do I do alert review? It's probably better if we meet face to face rather than through email. But if it's something about, like, I have this weird source that's a government <coughs> website that, you know, whatever, I can definitely address that over email. So, um, any questions about any of that stuff? Yes. Do you want students to send you a large rough draft for lots of editing? Well, no. <laughs> um, I am happy to edit with you side by side. I am not a private editor. Do you still have the service? We're working on hiring. Yeah, for? we're hiring someone. So um, there is an editing service available to you. My role is more to help you develop your ideas and the clarity in the language. So I'm helping you to develop your professional abilities in being an educational researcher. Um, and so a large part of that is like word choice, sometimes grammar comes into it, that's certainly relevant. I can help you with all that stuff, but I can't just take your rough draft and send it back to you as if it's been through the dry cleaners. So more, more of a teacher. I'm sure you can relate to that in your job site. <laughs> Oh, you do have my picture. I hate that picture. I was taken <laughs> last year, right after I had a baby, and I got a terrible haircut. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So please feel free to contact me. Uh, my main job is to work with you, and it's my favorite part of my job. So um, please come over anytime. We're in the library, room 208. Short walk. It's a very short walk. It's a very pleasant room. We're undergoing a remodel, and it will soon be very beautiful. So, all right, thank you. Can I put any extra cards? cards? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Are there any people who are missing? Should I leave a couple of them? Yes. Yeah, Christy's not here. Anybody else? Just a couple. I haven't okay. looked at the attendance. Not yet. Yeah. Does anyone want more sticky notes? Yeah, yeah leave us the report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, do you want it? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Dr. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. If you have any paperwork for Dr. Souter, now is the time. So ultimately, you'll have kind of three lines of defense, right, with your perspectives, with your proposal that you'll, write, you'll be writing. We will have our writing mentor here that will help you with the editing process, but you also have friends, neighbors, right, that can hopefully help you with those, at least with a proofreading thing to say, wow, that sentence doesn't make sense, right? May, may I throw in a good practice along those lines? And I would do this before you have lots and lots of pages written, but it is a really revealing kind of thing if you ask someone you know and trust to read it aloud to you. And when you see where they stumble, that clues you in right away. Okay? Yes. Okay, so get some editing help. Go to Rebecca for stylistics. If you don't know how to reference something, go to Rebecca. That's not a great thing to be emailing your chair when they're like teaching a bunch of classes. How do I cite this source in APA? And then they want to be like, I feel like that person looks great. Yes, yeah, never. <laughs> I'm so even tempered. So, Tim and Scott in this class. Who? Are you walking horse. Alyssa. So, those are your first two lines of defense. Right? Get it edited. Go to Rebecca for stylistic help and for scholarly writing kind of help and idea development. And then your chair is really supposed to be that academic mentor that's helping you say, yes, this is the right level. Yes, this is a this is a thesis that you're developing here. Okay, so kind of those three levels to work through almost every couple weeks. Okay. All right. I actually don't like saying that. <laughs> oh no, I did that. Is that next? That went really nice. I'll now turn the time over to Dr. Cox. Okay. <laughs> All right. Something else is about to get a very interesting experience. Okay. So we are going to be, for the next few minutes, 
speed dating. I don't know. Yes. Okay, so listen carefully what you're going to be doing. All right. About every three days, so basically every time you tell somebody you're in grad school, they're going to ask you, so what's your thesis about? Yeah. Right? All right. And you have to be able to give them the elevator speech, the 47-second version of what your thesis is all about. You have written that already, or a version of it. So you have your problem, your research questions, and your purpose. Okay? So what you need to do is take just a moment to craft that in a statement that you can say out loud to someone else. Okay, and then we're going to move you into our speed dating exercise. So, what if I'm concerned that I'm totally on the wrong track, uh -huh. and now I get this thing and I solidify it in my head, and I start and I tell it to 13 different people, uh -huh. and now I've got this moronic idea. It's just solidified. More than likely, what will happen is partway through be like, man, I hate this idea, and I am not going to do it. And then for the rest of your speed dates, you go through this like, I'm really in an identity crisis right now, and I don't know if I can get into a relationship. I'm just thinking about growing out of mullet. I just right. broke up. Right. 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 Exactly. So we're already back. That is so funny. I'm so glad you shared that. Good. All right. By the way, as part of the speed dating, Go ahead. That your date can ask you questions. Oh, yes. And help you yes. Verify. Definitely. So you'll get the chance to give your spiel, and then we'll do a debrief with your partner. They can ask you questions and say, wow, that doesn't make sense. Or are you sure you want to do that? That sounds crazy. Apparently, my body can't decide if I'm hot or cold. This is not a good sign. I know. That's why I'm not I'm going to pull your table. I'm going to sneak out for three minutes. Actually, I can pull this one. And fill this up. And we'll put Bristy right at the end, looking down the table. Is she right there? Not yet. Yes. We're asynchronous. She is at back to school night today. Oh, my favorite night. Right? Yeah. I taught at risk kids, so back to school night for me was like me by myself in a room for a really long time. And maybe, maybe three kids. Oh, yeah. Eighth grade is synonymous with at risk. That's very true. Thanks, Right? Okay, make your way down to these tables. A few of you will need to bring chairs with you as well. We need about four, three more seats right here. Which side is going to move? Which side is going to move? That side, right? Well, like alternate or something. No, we can't do that. There we go. We have more. We would love for you to sit next to me.
Everybody apparently. No, here's Daniel. He'll sit with me. I know, right? Mind blown. and help you debrief it and kind of try to punch holes in it. Are you sure you're passionate about this? What drew you to this topic? Yeah. Your research question sounds like you're trying to save the entire universe or change the entire school system. That's because we're superheroes. Those kinds of things. All right? Okay, so on your marks. Get set. Why is this recording? <laughs> I'm sorry. So take your point first. Hi, Go. <laughs> So, in my resource students, I've over the years seen a lot of like low self esteem, lack of engagement, um, and no confidence in like doing their own work. Um, so, they either don't want to do it or they just do it halfway. So, I started to think through questions on like why is their self esteem so low and how do I foster a sense of accomplishment or confidence. So, my purpose is to try and um, create a curriculum. Um, maybe not the entire virtually, but just some, you know, that will build engagement and at the same time give them the confidence that, that they can do it. And I want to focus on writing. Because um, really, we at our school, we have a pretty good handle on reading. And, and so really writing and math is where we're at. But I think... Yeah, I think writing is probably so what do we do? where my um, students how do we struggle most. Yeah. So what kind of resources are you thinking about? I want to look into different like writing programs, different like writing gurus, and see what they recommend, see if it's different than, than what I have been doing, or find new ideas, you know, stuff that will give them success. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, give you more time for one person. So yeah. the way it's supposed yeah. to work is you get one minute and you debrief for a minute. Then your partner oh, so gets that two minutes? minutes and you debrief for a minute. That was just the one. Oh, oh so we get one, one minute. minute. That's like the procedure. Okay, so you should debrief. Okay, so you should now be debriefing and asking questions on the first person. Okay. Okay. So you do want it. Yeah, yeah. So obviously those kind of kids are the ones who lack of support at home. Most of them, yeah. No, I think it's actually the future of the future of now we're going to do the boring part um, and look really briefly at things that you might, that you do need to remember. Also, if, um, if you have the handout that we gave you last week of the outline the, for chapters one through five, you might want to pull that up because you'll notice that there are some slight differences and so we'll try to kind of elaborate on what those are. But, what we're going to be working on for the next couple of weeks, three weeks, three weeks on the introduction. I will just start by telling you that in order to write your introduction effectively, you really need to be, be jumping into the literature. And so sometimes people even feel like they should write their literature review first. But, but we know you've done quite a bit of literature review writing in the last few months. And um, so we decided not to flip the order. But, but today, a little bit later, one of the things that will become really apparent is that as you start to write your introduction, um, 
it's important that you already know your purpose, your research question, all of those kinds of things, and you're pretty firm on that, which is why we kind of went the direction that we did. So, what I would like you to do is move again. Um, I have five, um, five projects. Some of them are ones you were able to look at last week. Some of them are not. Um, we're going to, to move into groups of four to five people. Actually, no more than four. Um, three to four people. And um, because we have fewer than 20 here. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'd like you to just go through just the <coughs> chapter one introduction and look at it a little more deeply in terms of um, a voice, the style of writing. Did they use these exact sections? Do they have different second um, level headings than these? But we're going to just take a couple of minutes, five, to do that. Um, so form your groups and we'll bring some books around. You gave me the small ones. Are you inferring that I am weak? Or you guys, I, I, I know what I'm not wanting. Oh, Adam, do you want to come over here with this one? This one is actually relevant to you. So whereas last time you mostly looked at headings and you were kind of looking at overall format, this time look at how they say things. Look at the writing. Look at how one section leads to the next. But again, you're only looking at chapter one. There's stains in there? You mean something's actually red? I guess that's what's my She's like, I'm always going to be in her little videos. Yep. <laughs> Actually, there are like three of them that are going to watch too. Uh, we now have four and a half. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so we have the capability. <laughs> I think it's interesting when they like say I, because like I'm always, I mean in other sections you can't say I, so. Right. Yeah. Maybe for just background? The, the background. Yeah. So you got the, everything that's coming to you. So we have the end of the chapter. Uh -huh. That was kind of just like, what is your position? This is going on, this is the issue. Right? Yeah, because that's the issue. So yeah. it, would it be like the purpose of like, the visual? Because it's a good way. Here, what else do we have? The statement uh, of the problem, the real problem. So the introduction is the term, statement of the purpose. Research question. <laughs> no, really. But I didn't really talk about like methodology or anything. Mm -hmm. And it's already. Yeah, yeah. Review yeah. methodology. Oh. Yeah. So it's more of a. Yeah. It kind of seemed like they're talking about, but they have like, they like source people too. Yeah. So. Well, you go here. So it's very formal. <laughs> So, so how do you state the problem here? So this is your like some writers uh, take a very direct approach, while others may be more reflective or 
Again, it depends on the topic and style of the project. The introduction does not have a section. So it's very formal. Got about two minutes left. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Here's my study. Okay, here's my problem. Again. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all intertwined somehow, you know? So. Maybe that's what you're saying. They have. So equations and we have to so they follow yeah and how do we get in paragraphs? We do is understanding what the issue is and how the question that's posed is relevant. Wait, so the question is this way. How do quality instructions towards achievement? Self perception and access to I like that section because I feel like they just like said it. They just like said the question instead of like. Yeah. They don't even ask my question. Questions guiding the study. It's true, in fact, there's an extrinsic so what is she going to do to answer the next question? Okay, yeah, so she gave them a survey about how they feel now compared to two years ago. <laughs> And then she kind of segues into the yeah. literature view, which is cool. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, she said 15 seconds and then walked away. I think we've had 15 seconds. <laughs> so, what are some of the things you've noticed? And see, we're not having you look, so you know, we're not having you look at more than one. So, in this case, he used uh, this, the author of this project used, used voice. Um, like the, the beginning of it's not it's not a humdrum, it's. It is okay. Yeah. Okay. So it engages. Yeah. All right. What else are you noticing? Starting with a story. Yeah. Something that happened. Okay. And How many of them actually started with some sort of experience or story? Okay. Just a couple. How did the others start? So that is something that, yes, is a decision that is made based on what kind of project you're doing and an agreement that you come to with um, your chair. All right. Um, even the ones, though, that had some sort of personal experience did. Did it still maintain an academic feel? Once we got or past get the to that, yes. So the stories section mm -hmm. and jumped right into more academic. Okay. Yeah, because he like sets everything up and then he gets into the Yes. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. What else did you notice? Moving further on. He defined what he was actually going to do. So before he even goes into the lit review or anything like that, mm -hmm. he tells you this is what teacher media suited. All right. You're not reading that stuff in the book. And was that right at the beginning or toward the end of that chapter? Mm -hmm. Okay. So how many of you in your introductory chapter had a section closer to the end that said definition of terms? 
So sometimes that's the way someone chooses to approach it. Sometimes if there's only a single term or a couple of terms, they'll define it in part of the narrative. All right? So that, so that they're just telling you up front what it is. More often than not, there's probably not a huge need for a definitions section. All right? But in some cases, there is very much a need for that kind of section. So again, that will vary by your project. And um, and will be a decision that you make with your chair. Other things you noticed? Ours was very passive and not really technical or academic. Right. In fact, there's I don't know how many references. Maybe one. There's like one reference in the whole first chapter. Ah, may we suggest that more than that would be advisable? <laughs> um, Striking a balance. Let's take away their master's yes. degree. <laughs> You do not want your introduction to feel like you're a literature review. Right. You want to make claims that are support. So basically, anytime you make a claim in your introduction, you do need to support that. If you're just giving some narrative, we don't need. Yes, and the only exception to that is if you are making a claim that is just general knowledge, that is just accepted. Divorce is prevalent in American society. You don't need to cite that okay? because it's general knowledge. Or okay. children are out of control in my classroom. They made me cry yesterday. Except you don't. Put that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too personal. They made this researcher cry. The <laughs> 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 <Not> researcher. <laughs> cool. Speaking of this researcher, me, etc. What else did you notice? I I just don't want to. I was excited and happy to see that it was first person. And I can write that way. All right. I'm not British. Mm -hmm. How many of yours <laughs> were first person? The really weird. In the intro, how many of them were written in first person? Pardon? It depends on the chair. It also depends on your topic. All right. It really does depend on the subject. If you are, for example, doing a self study, it's pretty hard to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Subject. Yeah. This researcher really improved over the course of this experiment. What I add is awesome. <laughs> Which is verified in self-study by three other people. <laughs> Including the researcher. <laughs> so, yes, so those will vary just a little bit. All right? Um, in this section, how many of you saw these these chunks, these pieces? Research per, per problem, purpose, research question, hypothesis, framework, or methods, framework of methods. How does this outline right here differ from the one that we handed you last week? Let's take a peek at it. Yes. So some of these are kind of larger categories in here that you may or may not need to break down a little bit more um, according to the other outline. So if we go to this other outline, we see that their general pattern is introduction to the chapter. That's not listed there, but you will obviously have it. All right? Then background of the study. These two things, introduction to the chapter and background of the study, those are kind of those first things that, that were um, included even possibly before your first level two heading. All right, so in your first few paragraphs, you are introducing the reader to the chapter and providing some background, okay? Whether it says it in the other outline as a requirement or not, you're doing that. Um, your problem statement, professional significance of the study, again, talk to your chair about this. Um, in many cases, we have students who come up and say, well, the professional significance is that my students will learn to spell better, right? or it'll improve my teaching. Um, on, on a dissertation level, you would expect more of a, of a professional significance kind of statement or section. But a number of you in the chapters you just read may have seen a paragraph or, or a section on professional significance. When you're talking about the significance, how, do you, how would you do that in not an I voice and make it like, this is why it's professionally significant for the researcher? Like, do I say, is this significant for the researcher? If you were to write in a third person, yeah, you could say the, the research, once the research is completed, it will improve this researcher's practice. 
That's why I hate using third person. Yes. <laughs> and, and but you can also say things like the resulting lesson plans could then be distributed and made available for other teachers. Okay. Those and that's more often where it is. Yeah. That you're talking about how it could generally it could help others. Yeah. All right. A lot of people wrap that into their purpose as well, just because like to make a heading and a chunk for something that's really that big, and then I feel like I've got to make it a paragraph, you know? Yes. So we say the purpose of the study is to do this, and it will benefit myself and other teachers in these ways. And you can lump them together. Depends on your job. Yes. And, and yes. all of those things. <laughs> your overview of the methodology will be very brief. In this in this chapter, um, some of you, if you look at the overview of methodology, how many paragraphs? One. Okay. Some cases one. Pardon. Yours had three or four. Oh. Okay. But everything that goes in here, you will elaborate and articulate much more completely in chapter three. All right. Delimitations, again, you may or may not want to have that as a section, but somewhere in this chapter, possibly just in your methods, you will describe and define kind of the parameters of your study. All right, that's what the delimitations are, that this study is studying this and not anything else. Yeah? I was just going to have you just clarify for me again. So uh, delimitations like, are your, your fits. Limitations are things you can't control. Right. And the delimitations are the things that you personally that you say. Choose. Yes. So you might say, this study will be conducted in an alternative high school in a social studies classroom with 27 students. That's it. Does it include an explanation <laughs> as to why? Like if there's a why? Like it's limited because of this? Yeah. I'm putting that limitation on because of, would you As an that? action research study, this needs to be conducted in my own classroom, or it's being targeted at this specific population because we want to see the effects within this specific population. Like, and, and besides which, in any study, you obviously have to have some delimitation, some parameter, right? To just define what it is you're studying. One of the things that people sometimes also put with something like that is this will be an alternative school with 27 10th grade students. Therefore, it is not presumed to be generalizable to um, a traditional high school. So something along those lines. And then definitions of key terms if they are needed. And particularly in education where it comes in, where we've seen it most useful, I think, often is in um, one that's for the ESL strand. And they're going to be using some acronyms. They're going to be using some terms that are just not commonly um, used. And so that can be helpful. The other place that they can sometimes be helpful is if there is a term that might have multiple definitions out in the world and you want to clarify that in this case, for this project, in this paper, this is what we mean by this term. Yes. Yes. In the research that I've done, I've found that it'd be beneficial because you, you do wonder sometimes what in the world this person's talking about. Yeah. And if there's a section that says, hey, here are your definitions, you can flip back that section and, and just, just make sure back. you're right, right on, on, the, on the same page. Absolutely. So to give you an example of that, right, in psychology, when we look at behavioral psychology, we study a, a, something called discrimination. We are not talking about discrimination Racial. racially or anything like that. We're talking about discrimination between stimuli and knowing which response goes which with, with which stimulus. So I might want to identify this is the kind of discrimination I'm talking about here. Right? So that kind of thing. <laughs> All right. Helping my students discriminate in a junior high school. You should have done this. All right. We're just going to encourage you to do so, as you work on your first chapter, you're going to start typing, and you're going to be, is typing even the word we can use anymore, but you're going to, you're going to be word processing, <laughs> and using your computer not like a typewriter. So we're going to talk a little <laughs> bit about setting up your paper. So part of what we've looked at, we're looking at today is the style guide. Um, and the first things that we need to have in that are our title page, our title page, the abstract, table of contents, and then the body, right? So one of the things that 
sometimes we struggle with as we get further down, um, the process is all the formatting of the paper. So if you have a computer, please, let's get to a computer really quickly. If you, for some reason, don't have one today, I'm a good friend. Thank you. All right. So, please be working. Yes. Okay. So this this may have been covered. Um, so we're looking at at the project proposal outlined from the style guide, but we're also looking at the introductory chapter. Or the, uh, outline. The outline. What's, what, why are we looking at two different things here? So, what I was explaining is that the style guide has the bigger chunks. This other outline kind of breaks those down to help you know more what goes in them. So, the style guide is that you absolutely have to have this, right? Okay. The outline, that, the other outline is from this text, which is called Writing the Winning Dissertation, Thesis or Dissertation. It gives a little bit, I feel like, more in-depth explanation, so it can just help enhance the basics that are in the style. Okay. Part two. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're talking about, we're going to start writing our introduction, are we talking about an introduction for Chapter a proposal, one. or are we talking about an introduction for the actual, are we different? In essence, we? in essence, they are almost the same. The big, what happens is if you have written your proposal effectively, after you complete all of your research, all you will do is go back and slightly modify that chapter one that you wrote for your proposal and put everything in past tense instead of future tense. So right now you'll be writing everything in future tense. Okay. Because this is what you are going to do. So by me thinking they're like two separate things, that means two different I, I think I know what you're asking, Jeremy, and that is within chapter one, which is called introduction, yes. there is an introduction, right? There are a couple of paragraphs of background or introductory material. We're talking right now about the whole chapter one. We will hone in later today on the different sections of that, and then your homework will be writing the first few. So, so we're not writing two paragraphs. introductions here. We're not talking about an introduction for our proposal and an introduction. No, nope. the okay. first three chapters are your proposal. Okay. Yep. So chapter one, which is introduction, chapter two, lit review, chapter three, methods. That's what you're proposing to do for your project. And then when it's yes. all said and done, we just kind of modify that. You turn it into yes. past tense. Fix and, anything. And, and then, yes. And every once in a while, you might modify it a little bit because things changed. You got it. Only right. a little bit. But yes. If you change it a lot, you got that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, and sometimes that change happens when you go to defense, and and you actually make modifications right then that you might not be required to go back and. Some people don't always require you to rewrite the chapter, but okay. So we want to take just about ten minutes and kind of set some things up, and, and hopefully, um, sometimes when we set this up, we just start with the body of the manuscript. But then you have to cut and paste that in to get the earlier, the previous pages. And so we thought it would just be simplest to start with, with the beginning. All if right? you do not have an actual computer today, you might want to do an over the shoulder. So sit yes. with somebody who has an actual computer because this is not doable on a tablet. And so, this is not doable in Google Docs, just to let you know. Yes, so I'm going to ask you to open up a, um, a Microsoft Word blank page. <laughs> And if you are doing the over-the-shoulder kind of thing, you might want to take some reminder notes. All right? All right. Those of you who are not taking notes, you could screencast what you do. <laughs> oh, cool. All right. The first page that you're going to have is your title page. Now, we've talked about, and um, I'm not even going to worry about formatting that right now, but if you'll just... Oh, fun. What do you know? This is written... If you look at it, oh goodness gracious, this says it's a heading one rather than normal. So highlight, unless you're on normal, I was looking at title one. Okay, so your title page. All right. 
Now, this says it is normal, meaning it'll be your text. You could also use um, body text if you have that there available for you. But in APA, what do we want to be using? This looks like it's using Calibri, size 11. Well, what we need is Times New Roman 12. So if you'll right click, do all of you have this in this area somewhere? Yeah, I'll come around and help you find those different things. If, if that's not up there, you're going to look at the top um, for, for styles is under format, under formatting. Yeah, the older Mac software, it's going to be in a different spot. Folks, what she's teaching you right now is how to actually use Word like a computer, right? Yes. So use the styles. You do not want to be going through and doing select all font times New Roman every time you make a change to your document. So what she's teaching you is how to change the style normal so that it is correct for APA for your pieces. You never have to mess with it again. Okay, so you're going to right click under normal, and the second choice here is modify. Modify. You're come, going to come into this window. You should have a window that looks pretty much like this. And just change here, Calibri, Calibri, to your Times New Roman and to 12. And for normal, we don't want bold or any of those kinds of things. We're adding that to the style gallery. We're clicking OK. So now our title page is cheerfully. Cheerfully in Times New Roman. So all we take okay. was the font and the size. Yeah. Yes, in this case. Font size 12. All right. Yes, font size 12. Can I rename it to So just for normal? This is just for normal. Okay. The next page that is going to be. Now, here's something interesting. Lots of times people go, okay, that's the only thing we need on the page. It's going to have your title page. It will have. Your title of, and it'll say a project submitted, a proposal submitted, and partial satisfaction, all that kind of thing. We'll do that later, all right? But now you need to get to the next page. And the simplest way to do that. After always, you hit enter a couple of times, because yeah, otherwise it messes with space. your formatting. Okay, <laughs> do a couple of spaces. And we're going to insert. Yes, except. I'm not on a Mac, so... Insert break, page break. break. But where is it right here? So yours should be... Can you just do um. control enter? Is that... Yeah, I don't know, can you? Let's find out. Does that insert a page break? It says control return. This one's command shift enter. Drop down. Yeah. Page break. Oh, yep. Okay, so if you have the same version I do, it's under pages. And it says there. control plus return. Yeah. Excellent. So control okay. return. Great. So now you're on your second page. We're still going to do normal right now. If you'll just type abstract. Okay. And then it was control return. After you hit enter once or twice. Okay. Our third page is table of contents. You may just want to say contents, but... It will be your table of contents. And then we're going to insert page numbers. All right. So, ooh, page numbers. All right. Here, when you click on page number, you can tell it where you want it to be at the bottom of the page. And you want it to be in the center. Let's see what choices we have here. Aligned. I'm not finding what I want. You're looking for I. Yeah. And I just can't see what it is playing. What we need is a lowercase Roman numeral, so help me see. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you probably just want to choose format page format page Okay. Well, let's start with... Yeah, format page numbers right here. Oh, right there. Okay. Format. So, the format that we want for... This is called the... Um, the first page is... I can't remember it. Front matter. This is called the front matter. We want lowercase Roman numeral. We don't want a chapter number. 
Chapter style starts with heading one. We're not worried about that right now. We can ignore it. We're starting at, it's the very first section, so we're not worried about continuing. Um, and the thing I'm not seeing here, let's click OK. Where do we want to start at, Deb? Is it? At um, I. At I? Yeah. OK. So page number. Slower. Bottom of page. Yes, okay. Because I could be center, but how many? Da da da. Clue chapter. We don't thought I would separate or continue previous sections. Start at I. So that's good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, but as you type and you format, you need to do things, for example, like make sure you don't have a hanging header at the bottom of a page. And when you change your margins later, it can really mess up your formatting. So the way you want to set your, your formatting, all your margins, and we probably should have done this starting from the very beginning, um, so we'll go ahead and do that part later, um, is that it's one inch on the top, one inch on the right, one inch on the bottom, 1.5 on the left. So just set that up. That's the mark. So it's custom. Wait, wait, wait. 1.5 or 1.25? 1.5. So you have to go to the other one. Say that again. Everything's one except for the left is 1.5. Yes. Can I just type? So you have to go to custom margins, right? I guess. Because we are going to go to 2,000 Left is 1.5 because you're going to print it and bind it on the left. Yeah. So we yes. have space for bikes. So it's to leave that space. <laughs> the other thing is that you will notice on the spacing here um, that very often you'll have some extra space before or after a sentence. So we take that down to zero. Okay. When you do the margins custom, it says apply to, you want the, the whole paper. Yep. Yeah. So apply your margins to the whole document. Double spacing throughout, zero space before and after. Okay, so watch for those three things. Okay. Now, the next... So now... Okay, you're going a little too fast. Okay. <laughs> so, go like this when you have your margins set. 1.5 on the left, why everywhere else. Okay, what was the thing that you just said about spacing? Um, and that may be on most of your computers under on my PC that's actually under format dot paragraph I mean on my Mac so the default on my Mac is 10 points after, Yes, you're going to set it for double space. You'll be doing everything double space, but you don't want that additional space before or after. Right. Yes. If I start this on my desktop and then I email it to myself and start working on it on my set of Gently, she'll be able to. Okay. Did we get Did we get those two things? And and like I say, on my Mac, the setting of the um, eight points or ten points before or after is under paragraph formatting paragraph. Okay. So the very first thing that we're going to write, now that we have you know our margin, is um, chapter one. Period. Introduction. Well, let me look. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Now they don't go on the same line. But here's a magic trick. Listen magic carefully. Trick. Well, actually, yeah, maybe we'll show the magic Don't trick. Go too fast. <laughs> so we type that in, and it's going to be a level one heading. So right now it's just normal. If I click on it, you'll see that this bar, or in, in the case of some, there's a window that says it's normal, okay, up toward the top left. But we want it to be a heading one. So we're going to highlight it. Select it and click our heading one and go away. Oh, Sorry, that's not what it's supposed to look like because we've all looked at the APA manual and we know that it's supposed to look different than that. So we're going to right click and modify. And for our heading one, we're going to come in here and tell it what should it be. And and it should be bold. And it should be black. Thank you. And then, okay. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped one thing on the modifying. It should also be centered. 
Oh, All right. Centered. Okay. Ah. All right. So there's our chapter one heading introduction. And then, no, because you remember you have that one. When you go to normal. Ah, so I don't have my double space. I firmly believe you should get an honorary master's degree in Word document formatting. Yeah. Okay. I'm really surprised it didn't jack up your heading. That's word style. It's like when you when you change anything, it, then all of a sudden it just changes it all back to that's why we're and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, but from now on, look, you're heading one. Should always follow that. When I go to heading one, it knows to do it. When I go to normal, it knows to go there. Okay. So you start typing your introduction. All right. Um, which you will indent. Um, Okay, here comes the magic trick. So here comes the magic trick, except that we probably need to insert some page numbers before we get to this magic trick. So now we're going to insert our page numbers for this new section. Okay, we did a section break. So page numbers, and in this case, we still want them on the bottom of the page. Oh, but we don't want that little letter I, so let's format our page numbers. In this case, we want to start with the Arabic one. And we're starting at one. We're not continuing the previous section, so that's okay. And then our page numbers, we want them to be bottom of the page and center. And this, in this case, we do want the number to show, even on the first page of the chapter. Okay? So here we are on chapter one introduction, page one. All right? And then here's where the magic happens. Come back up to your table of contents page, and we're going to center it, and then we're going to go right under here. Wait, is table of contents, is that a, then that's still normal? Um, actually, it is normal, but I will tell you that we're going to bold it and center it, but keep it normal, all right? So just this one exception. You want it to look like a level one heading, but you do not want it to be a level one heading. We'll see why in a moment. All right. So now, again, let's insert a table. And we're going to. No. Okay, someone help me find where table of contents is. Insert table of figures. Insert. Don't you have to Table, right here. Okay, table of contents. So we're going to insert a table of contents, and just pick one of these. We'll fix the formatting afterwards. But um, wait, yes, we're adding a table of contents, which in my case is over here on the left. In um, my Mac is under insert, and it'll be tables. Okay, and we have an automatic. Let's see what we have here. Okay. It's under references. Well, here it's under references. On the Mac, it should just be under your insert tab. Your insert. No, they're not. There's a table, but it doesn't say table. Indexes and tables. Indexes and tables. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Sorry, I'm jumping back and forth. Insert indexes and tables, and then there's table of contents. Now, right now. You can probably, it seems like classic is probably the closest. Classic? Uh -huh, but we can fix the formatting on it later. Just classic. Yeah, it's the choice. Okay, but I'm going to take this first one right here, and so look, it's going to give me a blue content, so I'll have to fix that later. But I'm going to click that to insert it, and it pulls it from the page. So the reason you want to do this is because then, okay, let's go down a little further. And let's say that we've done our first paragraph, we've done all that kind of thing, and then we're going to do um, a level two heading. Background of the problem. We'll just call it our level two heading. So we're going to highlight that, tell it it is 
a level two heading, but obviously we're going to modify that. So what's a level two heading? What do we need to change? Yes, and it is still bolded, but it is left justified. Okay. Oh, back. Okay. Back is Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to show you something really quickly here, okay? I can't tell if this is bold. It's not. I didn't think so. Okay, so let's go back to my heading to modify. Tell it to be bold. Tell this it's a level two. Oh, that's the problem. Okay. All right. And I, oh, I needed to have told it double space, but we'll just put that down. Okay. Yes, question. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, are we? If you you've inserted your table of contents, it picked up your chapter one. Okay. Now I'm just going to just kind of give you this as an example. After you write your first few paragraphs, here's your first level two heading. So you're going to have gone up to your headings and formatted that so it's correct, right? <coughs> and then the reason this becomes valuable is because then we come up to here and we're going to insert... What do you just update? Update it. Yeah, where is it? It's right at the top of the table. Yeah, it's right, yeah. Long yeah. Long yeah. Yeah. Long yeah. Yeah. Oh, right there. Thank you. Again, different. So update page numbers. No, we're going to update the entire table. Okay. So now it grabs that next heading. Okay. Now you're going to want to set up your, um, when you go into table of contents and you're formatting it, we recommend that you only have it grab your level one and level two headings. All right. Some of you, some people may say, oh, I want to go to my level three headings. But generally, if you just have your level one and level two, you'll be good in your, in your table of contents. But, oh, oh, but here's the deal. We're going to update again in a second. In your, in chapter one, it's not supposed to all be on the same line. So you'll type chapter one. Here's the magic trick. Pay yeah. attention. Yeah, pay attention. So here it is. Chapter one, the next line down is introduction. Now let's go up and update our table of contents. Uh, oh, sorry. Update whole table. Oh, no! It put it on the next line. But I have to have it on the next line down here. So here's the magic trick. Backspace that so it's back with it. And now do a shift enter. And that shift enter magically makes the table of contents think that they're on the same line. So now we'll update our table. Update entire table. Okay. What do you know? Introduction is on the line there, but it's below on the actual document. Yes. So type it all on one line. Then put the cursor right before the word introduction and hit shift enter. Okay. Okay. 
yeah, and it should be double spaced so like that. Yes. So every chapter's title yes. is going to be on a separate line. Yes. So it'll be chapter two, literature review, chapter three, methods. And when I see it this way, that's when I'm not sure if I really want the period. All right. Now, why, why is it advantageous for you to use styles and set up your table of contents and your head, headings, level one and two headings? Why is it useful to do that instead of just doing it manually, holding and putting it? Left justified and separate. How have you ever done this manually and you change a sentence and suddenly all the pages are wrong? And you have to go through and try to find where everything changed and fix your table of contents? By the way, did you also notice did we have to do lots of little dots across? Did we have to try to line up? Right? Oh. So we absolutely want to set this up right at the beginning. Now, don't worry about updating your table of contents every time you do anything. All right? Once you get things pretty final, then update your table of contents. Yeah. So on the chapter, whenever we do new chapter, we have to do that shift enter? Yes. Okay. Chapter two, three, you'll want to do that shift enter. Okay? Now, for those of you who are feeling horribly overwhelmed, <laughs> yes. where <laughs> might you go in the interwebs? To find YouTube. this information. YouTube. <laughs> okay? Go to the YouTubes and you will find what you need. I promise. Okay? What? And, and what do you put like a for mine something? Formatting style. For mine something. Yeah. Yes. If you're really lucky, I maybe like if you bring me Diet Dr. Pepper Cherry and some dark chocolate. Maybe I could make a screencast of it for you. And if you have questions, you can Maybe. try to find me and I can have to work it out on your computer. Or you update the content, the table of content, so that you have like the right font. Yes, so you can do that. I don't have time right this second. Yeah, she's supposed to be gone already. So. Um, and sometimes what I do is just this. <laughs> That's what I was going to do. Right? Yeah, sometimes you just cheat it because Word wants to do its own thing. Okay. All right. So really, the only styles you should need are style for level one heading, style for level two heading, style for level three heading. You shouldn't really have to go beyond that. And when you're setting up your table of contents, I would suggest that it only grab one and two unless you and your chair say, we want to grab all three. Okay? Some people do that. That's fine. All right? Okay. And you know what? I can't tell looking at it. I don't think it is. Um, and if it is, it really shouldn't be. No, see, that is older than that's not. All right? But part of the reason, why don't we call it, this looks like a level one heading. Why don't we call it that? Why don't we use the style? Yes, because then it would insert itself into the table of contents itself. I was just thinking for okay? Right. You must and, want me in your table of contents. Yeah. I want to talk about myself. Okay. All right. And at some point, not today, when you do your abstract, it'll actually be a level one, and so it will. You'll have that in the table of contents as well. Okay. okay. All right. We will continue to Ask address me this, in Jeremiah. A Ask me in a minute. Okay. Anyway, thank you, and we will go back to there. To Gotham. There. Yeah. Oh, there. So we looked at the style guide and styles, and thank you, and I'll see you next week. Excellent. Okay, so there will be a quiz on that next time. You're <laughs> <laughs> my job. All right, so what I'll do, okay, you needed to do that so that you can get started because really your homework for this week is to write what we're calling your initial draft of your chapter one, which means it's going to suck. Right? Okay. It is not going to go very good. It's going to be your best first attempt, but it'll be crummy. Okay? If you start with the formatting in place, you're saving yourself major headaches later. Right? My brother wrote his entire dissertation just right and right and right and right and right. And then I formatted it for him for like three days. 
okay? Because he hadn't started with it, and it's a nightmare. So if you know how to do it, help someone who does. Me. <laughs> okay? But I'll go ahead this weekend and make you a screencast of everything we just talked about so that you don't have to panic if you missed one of the steps. If you're working with a different version of Word than I have, then you might need to do use this tool I've heard of. The YouTubes or the Googles. Okay? But you'll find what you need, I promise. You just need to know what those search parameters are. So now you know what some of those are. Creating a table of contents in Word and whatever version you have, right? Make sure you're always asking with the version that you have. So creating a table of contents in Word 2008 or Word 2010 or whatever it is. Uh, formatting styles in Word, whatever version you have. Okay? Mac or PC. Mac or PC, exactly right. So clarify which versions you're working with so that you get the right instructions. <coughs> if all else fails, come to me. You and I can sit down together. We can figure out how to do it properly, okay? Use your resources. Yes, use your resources. Okay, what I'd like you to do, because I know probably right now you're feeling a little bit like, what just happened to me? <laughs> okay, save your document. Yeah. <laughs> and let's do you talk about version control. What? Versions with an S. <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about chastity belts here. We're talking about your documents. Okay, so here's the thing. What's going to end up happening? If you work in this Word document, which will make your life nice later because the formatting's all done, then you're going to end up sending versions back and forth between you and your chair and your other committee members, right? Right. And then you're going to end up going, oh crap, which version am I supposed to be working from? Yes. Okay. Your other alternative is to work in, like, Google Docs, for example. That's one alternative. Formatting, awful, awful, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. <laughs> okay. It's more convenient, but you don't want to go there. So you could think about looking at Dropbox. You could think about looking at Office 365, other cloud alternatives. Okay, because that would allow you to kind of pare down the versioning while still keeping the formatting of an actual Word document. Okay, if you're going to be doing the emailing back and forth, pick a naming convention, stick with it, and use it religiously. Okay, so I'll give you an example of what I mean. When I do this with my students that I chair, I do something like maybe you're only going to do chapter one in this. I don't recommend it. Just start the document and add on to it. So you're going to do, for example, use this project, whatever you want to name it. Personally, I would do this. So my chair knows whose document it is and can save it to their folders correctly. You know, you don't have to name it for yourself, but it helps. Okay. Then I do this. Okay. September, yeah, September 2nd, 2015. So the date on which I was working on it. Because then it's really, really easy to find the most recent document. And I name it in this order because you are going to be working on this for the next year and a half. Okay? So at some point, we will go into the 2016s and they will be in order if you do the year first and then the month and day. Okay? And then personally, what I do as the chair. When I send this back to you, and you can talk with your chair about this and tell them, well, Donald Trump says this, go ahead, I don't care. They're used to me telling them, well, with technology, this is how I do it, okay? I actually add after the date, Dr. C on mine, so my initials or something like that, so that then you know this is the version Dr. Cox marked up, not the version I then fixed, okay? So this is the version I marked up on that date. So just get a naming convention, work it out with your chair or with yourself, however you want to do it, and stick to it and use it religiously. So that if something happens and you mess up a version somewhere, you can always go back to an older one. So every time you save, I mean, not if you're working on it on the same day for an hour or two, right? But every time, every new day when you save your changes, do a save as and change date. So yeah, you will end up with a folder on your computer with like 84 versions of your thesis. So just make a folder now. Yeah, just make a folder now. Folder now.
for your thesis project and save these in there. Okay? Within that folder, you might want to make another folder for your literature review. And within that folder, you may want to make <laughs> folders for each of the topics within your lit review. Be organized about it. It will save you major headaches later. Okay, so get your folders organized. Think of your naming convention. Use your styles, and you're going to be so happy. Okay? <sighs> and Lucy's going to be all I'm no, just kidding. She's not really. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, so we normally wouldn't do this, but because I know this is a little bit like, whoa, that was fast, and we're overwhelmed, let's take a five minute break to just decompress, do whatever you need to do, and then we're going to come back and start really focusing on writing. I should, we'll do it. We're going to do this. Yes, I can turn the rest of the time. I'll find out how to use the plugin, doesn't matter. I dropped like hard. So. That's where I want to hear. So I have two. We always have one of the So one is identifying measurements that are some of the signs that we can use <laughs> as educators to help identify the kids that we do need to work with. Now, do you think that's a question that's going to be answered in the literature? Do you think the answer is already out there? I don't know. I haven't seen very many slides. So that's why I'm just kind of wanting to answer that question. Okay. But then the other one was, um, like, I, like there's, the, there's a huge discrepancy between or ELL students and their science testing students. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, what they do kind of goes back to happening, right? Yeah. 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 Because with the science, you can do either. But the measures, it's really going to be more like heavy duty instrument, instrument, maybe testing the instrument, maybe even, just depending on what you're wanting to do. Okay. So, so, what are you most passionate about? Are you passionate about the discrepancy in gifted programs, or are you passionate about the discrepancy in the science? I'm both. That's why I was asking you, like, which one would fly better? So, because like, there is a lot of research on the ELL and the gifted. Like how to identify them so that way. Not time. Be I hurt. just realized that I started teaching the first class right. twelve hours ago. Um, then, so then I will go. So you know, if there's a lot, then I will go to the other one. But if there is not something like that, I will. Minutes, but I don't know what it is. Okay. So you're going to want to do some lit review. Teach a class at okay. six forty-five. Yeah. 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 See what's out there. Okay. And then, so I see, wow. if there is a lot out there. Never mind then. I was up 12 hours ago. I got the early morning class. And then I never showed up. Yes, I had. During school, I never showed up. Oh, she is. So either one of those would actually be And they are topics that she can be relevant. So my typical completion rates in the mid 90s. Oh, my typical completion rate is roughly like the mid to high 60s. Okay, so I would say that the Yeah. 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 Yeah.
To be killed, future tense. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We ready? We're close? That was a cute song. Right? <laughs> Dr. Cook and I played that over and over and over and over and over and over when we were working on our 10 year binders. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Okay. The word tenure sounds so much like tenure. Right? Does it feel like it? Yeah. Just putting together the binder feels like 10 years. <laughs> all right. week is to really try to take that elevator pitch. First of all, decide if you're really happy with it, with, with that topic, if that's something you can be passionate about for the next year and a half, right? If it's something that you can do that you're going to feel like you made a difference, even if it was a little one and even if it was for one kid, right? Then that's what we want to move with. If you're feeling like, well, I guess, <laughs> it's probably something you want to talk about, okay? Um, so your task for the week is to take that little elevator speech and turn it into your initial draft of your chapter one. Okay? And it's really tempting to try and start with the first couple of paragraphs because isn't that where you're supposed to start? Is that the beginning? But it's actually the hardest to start with. Okay? So personally, I strongly recommend that you take what you've already got your problem, research questions, and purpose, and elaborate those, okay? And I would also suggest that you switch the order. So we're gonna do problem first, then purpose, then research questions, okay? So if you wanna go ahead and be working in that same document, you could certainly go in, And whether you actually use the heading background of the problem or not, it's kind of the choice of your chair and yourself. I personally never ever use that heading, okay? Because I'm gonna go ahead and have the first three paragraphs, however long it takes, be the background of the problem. And do we ever have a heading right after a heading? No, no. no. never, never, never. Okay, so you would never have chapter one introduction, background of the problem, go. Okay, you just start right in. And we just assume that you're giving us some kind of introduction or background. That's what usually happens in those first few paragraphs. So you don't necessarily have to use that heading. Okay, so my first level two heading might be, I'm speaking Spanish in my head today, so every B I'm typing as B and vice versa, and it's very entertaining. Okay. Oh, that explains that joke. Which joke? All of them? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All of my bad jokes? Yeah, those. Okay. So I might have a problem statement as my first heading. And then purpose. And it's really tempting to bold that, right? You want to just naturally bold it. Don't do it. <laughs> Use your styles. And you can say purpose statement if you'd like to. Ooh, she did not format that as a double space heading. Uh -uh. Yes. Modify double space. Thank you. Ooh. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I am not your traditional professor, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and there's some extra. You have a doctor, there. you're allowed to do that. Right? That's what I keep telling him anyway. <laughs> Now, even the heading research questions could potentially be altered. So, for example, I have a graduate student right now. Her project is the development of a multidisciplinary, large scale web quest kind of inquiry environment using tech. We're not using research questions for that. It doesn't make sense because she's not researching, she's creating on a large scale. So, we have project objectives. For her. So that is a possibility. 
okay? Because your research questions are not necessarily how do we motivate people, because that's answered in your lit review. We're, we could potentially say what would it look like to develop this large scale unit, or we could just say we have some project objectives, and one of those objectives is to design a unit that, right? Okay, so again, talk with your chair about whether research questions or design or, or project objectives are more appropriate for what you're doing. I know that's frustrating for us to say it depends and ask your chair on things, but that's kind of how it goes. All right, so this is the meat of what we're trying to accomplish and how do they feed into each other. Okay, I'm just going to kind of give you a flow chart. You might also imagine it as kind of a funnel. And every chapter actually ends up being a bit of a funnel in nature. Okay, so those first few paragraphs are going to be somewhat broad, saying, here's what's going on in the world or in my school or in my classroom. This is kind of a broad thing. Okay, then here's what I'm seeing as the specific problem. So we've narrowed it down, right? Within that specific problem, which might still be somewhat broad, here's the purpose of my particular study that I'm doing. This is what I am trying to accomplish. And by accomplishing that, I'm going to answer these specific questions. So we're drilling it down. Here's the bigger context. Here's the problem that I'm seeing. Here's the purpose of my project. Here are the questions it's going to answer. All right, so that's kind of the, the format that you're looking for, the flow that you're looking for within your first chapter. Okay, questions that you have there? All right, now if up here, this will come later, I want you to focus on this part. We are actually going to take hopefully the last like 20 to 30 minutes to just write, consult with me, those kinds of things today, okay? Up here, you are going to have to do some work, right? So do these first, but then start writing those introductory paragraphs. So what we have for you in Canvas, I don't even know what happened back there. My superhero failed me. Okay. There is a PowerPoint that we stole, to be perfectly honest. Um, that's an introduction to introductory paragraphs. Okay. So when you're ready to write those introductory paragraphs, the bigger context-y stuff, go through that. Okay, get some ideas about how to craft those. It's really kind of the same thing as when you're writing an essay, right? You want a hook, you want to make some claims with some support, it's the same kind of thing. Okay, so that'll help you walk through those sections. But I was just talking with Sharice and she was like, you know, I, I, I want to even know if this is a question that I should be asking. Okay, but getting into the databases and, and using the right search terms can be difficult when you're still a little bit on the broad side. Um, so personally, I always, always, always start in Google Scholar. Always. Okay. Sometimes I even start just like out in normal Google. Don't, <laughs> don't tell. And don't use those references in the thesis. Okay. <laughs> Please. Uh, what's Google Scholar? Okay, that's what I was about to show you. Okay. Well done. All right, so it's just one of your Google tools. You can actually find it if you go to the, to the Google Apps little icon and then go to more. What? And then go to even more. Like it hides. Even more. From you. <laughs> <laughs> like and then you have to find it. It's right there under specialized search. Easier? Just remember it. Scholar.google.com. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> you're a scholar now. And so you should remember that. Okay, so if I'm curious about identifying gifted ELL students, okay, now what Google Scholar does for us is it's going to give us results from all over the place. Okay, and then we can say don't include patents, that's not going to help me. And we can say, for example, if you're working on a tech master's, 
you probably don't want articles from 1963. I'm just saying. You might not even want articles from 1999 or 2009. It just depends on how techy your thesis is, right? So we can say I only want articles from 2011 or something if you really wanted to see what is going on in this field right now. Okay? So then we can start going in and just filtering and seeing, you know, what really is in here about that specific topic. Uh, we could even do, instead of ELL students here, why don't I put in quotes, English language learners. And that's going to change now. Disproportionality in special education identification and placement of ELLs is in there. Okay. So personally, I start here. Then I take the journals, the article titles, etc., and go to the library to find those. Because this will not give you direct access to most of the publications, right? This will just give you search results, and then you can take those into the, <coughs> to the library databases and find those. Okay. Another trick, sometimes I cannot find things in our library databases, but I can in Pioneer Library. So if you have access, if you're, you're all Utah educators, you can get access to Pioneer Library. Um, but if you have an account on this or you want to set one up, your kids have one, if you're teaching public school around here, okay, go to Pioneer Library. If you log in as an educator, that's how long ago I got mine. Okay, EBSCO is in Pioneer Library. Okay, so that is like the biggest library database <laughs> that you can have access to, okay? You could do the kids search or search thesaurus, but they probably will not give you what you need. <laughs> Just, yeah. So you can come up here to EBSCO hosts, go into the college and university. You can even select all of the databases if you're just afraid you're going to miss something, right? And then it's like it's going to take forever for me to search everything. <laughs> anyway, then you can come in here and you can look. So if you're not finding stuff in the UVU library, you can come here. Or you can request it through the UVU library from Interlibrary Loan. And they can get copies of articles from any library in the Interlibrary Loan network, with, usually within a week. Please. Is there some benefit to using to, for Pioneer Library being the host of EBSCO like, as opposed to the UVU library? Just sometimes I can find articles on here that I can't find on UVU, and I don't know quite why that is. So I'll try UVU first, and then if I can't find it, I'll come and look here. And sometimes they just have subscriptions to journals, UVN does, that UVU did not. Also, you have, with your... Being a UVU student, you get access to BYU's library as well. And the U's. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so you do have cross network opportunities there for library searches. So. That works both ways, or do you just pull check? No, it works both ways. We're nice like that, reciprocal and crap. <laughs> okay. All right, for now, if you know that you have read something, <laughs> right, but you just can't remember where it was, and you want to get the writing down first. A lot of times the way I'll write things is, look, I know this is how it is because I've read the lit. I just don't remember where it was. I'm going to write my chapters and then do a big, fat, all caps, citation needed as a placeholder. Okay? And then you can go out and find the literature that supports your statements. Yes, we cherry pick the literature that supports our statements. <laughs> okay? In the introduction, you bet you're hiding to do. In the lit review, you're going to have to present opposing arguments and say, you know, this is what the majority of people think, but there is some opposition. Here's the, the lit. But in the introduction, you don't have to do that. In the introduction, you're saying, here's the context. Here's the argument, not argument, but here's kind of what we see going on. Therefore, this is what the problem is. Here's the purpose of my study. Here are my research questions. Lit review, tackle the bigger issues of who says what. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. All right. Okay, so what's your focus going to be for the first half of this week? Uh, 
questions. Problem persons with purpose questions. Absolutely. Make sure you kind of you've got a solid idea of what your problem is, what you want to accomplish with your project, and then really attempt to craft those research questions. Okay? From there, you can either go then on to methods. This is what I think I want to do for my project as far as like I want to do a creative project and I think it's going to look something like this. Or I want to do an action research study and I think it's going to look something like this with a pre-post intervention kind of a thing. Okay, so you can sketch that out. It only needs to be a paragraph or two. And then you can come back and make your claims at the beginning. I, again, I think that's the hardest part until you really have your center section nailed down. So you, so you want the rough you want the rough draft, the first draft of all of that then? Ideally the initial draft would have all of it. But if you've got this really good, that's yeah, I would rather have that than I really have no clue what I'm doing here. Okay, so focus here, and then if you feel like you're ready, move out for this time. So largely what we're doing next time is you're going to bring three hard copies. Again, this stuff called paper that you've heard of. Okay, You're going to bring three hard copies of your initial draft. And we're going to do writing circles with those, meaning that you're going to have a chance to sit with peers and with Dr. Escalante because I have a state board meeting once a month, okay, so I won't be here, um, to sit down, exchange those, read through each other's work, give each other feedback on what's not clear, all that kind of stuff. This is a huge advantage of having this class, is that you have a writing circle at your disposal. Okay. How are you feeling? <laughs> Odds are we're going to be all right. Odds are you're going to be all right. Right? If you come back next time with the crappiest initial draft we've ever seen, <laughs> you will Yes, I would be like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Okay, exactly. I would totally want you to tell me that. And I would be surprised. And then we would save the copy for you to show it to other students as the worst draft. Oh, this is the worst one. You can't do worse than that. <laughs> okay. Um, but if you do, you nobody will die. No, that's the great part about it. Trees die. But that's <laughs> It's true. My tattoo will be beeping. Okay. All right, so the rest of our time tonight. I encourage you to use it to, to write, okay? even if you need to find a quiet space, because you've set a time, aside this time in your calendar to write, or to be in class. You might write. Um, if you feel like you would like some time with me, then stick around. Okay. <laughs> we'll probably have to do a we'll probably have to do a sign up on the board so that I have a clear trajectory and I'm able to get to everybody in time. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that up here. Five is going first. Me first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Maybe it's first. <laughs> no, you should It's a good dinner right there. I'm like, no. Cheaters. Dixon, teachers, and cheaters. No. Yeah, I'm going to stop recording. Get this done right. We still love you, dude.